Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome. In fact, uh, good morning to our guests who are joining us from the Western region right now. And uh, a very good evening to our guests. I'm told they're joining us from Singapore and other parts of the Eastern region. And we are about 542 strong in attendance as of now. And we have people joining us from various parts of the globe, including the Middle East and Africa today. On behalf of Institute of uh, Directors India and Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India, I'm your host, Ritika, welcoming all of you to this very, very special first edition of Independent Directors Dialogue Series. We have with us our esteemed IOD members, associates of IICA, and um, our uh, family of IOD from across geographies. A very warm welcome to you all. The theme for the very first edition today is going to be building corporate governance competencies in boardroom to independent directors. Now, why we thought of this theme was because in the current scenario where we see unprecedented uncertainty, companies across the globe, they are looking at getting on board independent directors who have experience in handling crisis and unprecedented situations and can also challenge conventional thinking therefore the theme of this very first edition today and we are deeply humbled and extremely honored that we have with us some very important distinguished leaders who will today as part of this edition be sharing their insights their strategic perspectives and their vast experience on how they think and they can guide us through a more sustainable future but before we begin all of that let me first call upon Lieutenant General J.S. Aduwalia, President of Institute of Directors India. Welcome, sir. I request you to please deliver the welcome address. Yes, members of IOD, on behalf of both Institute of Directors and the Institute of Corporate Affairs, a venture of Ministry of Company Affairs, Government of India, headed by our and reputed Director General, Dr. Samir Sharma. The theme for today is building corporate governance competencies in the boardroom through independent directors. <clears throat> this first of the dialogue series has been jointly organized both by IOD and IICA and uh, who are our valued partner for the series. As you know, IOD is an independent, not-for-profit, membership-based, sole association of professional directors in India. Its main role is to prepare future boards and board-ready directors. Also, it represents directors, including independent and women directors, and their issues with the government, Ministry of Company Affairs, and regulatory bodies, the media. IOD's major tasks include training of corporate directors and keeping them updated, networking of corporate directors, through workshops and regional, national, and international conventions, including the three annually held by us in London, Dubai, and Singapore. The board research and advisory, which also deals with compliance and annual board and directors performance evaluations. The Golden Peacock organizational awards in 15 different corporate functional verticals they are for raising the quality through competition, bringing out directors' publications and journals for directors' ready reference. This webinar is very apt, timely, informative for boards and independent directors. Companies need boards that are as as the society and community it serves and future and crisis ready. They take advantage of the social media for instant dialogue with large audiences. Of course, a company is a separate legal entity, a complex network of people and processes, and is as good as those who lead it. The key parties, of course, are the shareholders, the board of directors, and the management. Forced by a number of corporate scandals in USA and UK, the corporate governance came under special focus since 1990. The Cadbury Report of 92 
followed by four reports of Dr. Mervyn King of South Africa, led to the global OECD principles of corporate governance. Both Cadbury and Dr. King have addressed IOD's London Global Convention uh, quite a few times. In spite of corporate governance reforms and periodically updated country corporate governance codes, frauds continue to follow. In India, Enron, Satyam, and recent ones riddled with conflict of interest like ILNFS, ICI, ICI Bank, further exposed the underbelly of corporate governance. The corporate governance helps to direct, manage, and control an organization. It is a system of checks and balances, a journey without a final destination, a way of life and principles, not a set of rules, responsible, responsive, transparent, and citizen-centric, sets tone and behavior at the top, leading to to impact individual behaviors. It lays guidelines for the board, culture, composition, diversity, and creates environment, trust, and accountability. There is a care for stakeholder interests and protects minority shareholders, compliance of laws, rules, and ethical practices. It promotes robust, flawless operations and brings in global best management processes and practices. An incremental step-by-step -step journey, not waiting for the next scandal to arrive. Protocols are necessary, but always need to trim outdated rules, extra management layers, shattered boundaries that prevent cooperation and information sharing. The independent directors are real guardians custodians and gatekeepers of corporate governance and interests of stakeholders. They require qualification, training, corporate experience, financial and legal literacy, and risk and strategic skills. They question intelligently, debate constructively, challenge regressively, and decide dispassionately. The diversity and independence of thinking with a long-term macro view of the organization. Their active role in board committees acts as catalysts for good governance. Basically, chairman manage the board and CEO manage the organization. The main problems really have been the lack of boardroom diversity, absence of succession planning, poor risk, and strategy exposure. The Cranfield survey of the independent directors had summarized that 78% of independent directors are not even clear how their companies create value and how they are able to support or add value to it. Majority of them do not have proper exposure to the national and global sector status in which their company operates. Few do understand major company problems, but many of them do not know how to tackle them head on. Independent directors remain also beholden to the CEO and promoters for their selection and remuneration, thus making it difficult for them to ask awkward questions and antagonize the board. They cannot, they become basically Dependent independent directors. Responsibility for selection and of independent directors is the nub of the issue. They require a clear, transparent policy and a process for selection and dismissal of independent directors that will bring the boardroom diversity and other required changes. The clamor for better governance refuses to lie down. Last year, we noted the resignation by a large number of independent directors, basically to protect themselves and their reputation. A proper study for this is called for to settle the problem. The good part has been that SMEs have been on an overdrive to induct independent directors. They want to add talent pool of functional experienced professionals, guide them and help their organization. 
I'm looking forward to listen to an enlightening array of top speakers on the subject today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, General Aluwalia, for the warm welcome. Yeah. And now we, it's time we move on to the opening address. And for that, I would like to request our co-host IICA, led by Director General and CEO Dr. Samir Sharma IAS, to please do the honors. Um, Dr. Samir Sharma is 85 batch, um, Andhra Pradesh Kader, a very senior officer, um, MSc in chemistry and uh, in uh, PhD in globalization and urban development from University of Cincinnati, USA. And we are extremely privileged to, to have him among us. We request you, sir, to please deliver the opening address. Dr. Samir Sharma. Thank you, Ritika. Thank you. And uh, today I'll be speaking about an initiative of the Government of India, which is the Independent Directors Database Portal. Now, again, just for the sake of repeating what General Alu Ali has said, good corporate governance is key to sustain corporate success and the economic growth of a nation. That is very well it's a cliche. In turn, again, a cliche, corporate governance is the responsibility of the board, and IDs are key players in the board. All of us acknowledge that. Then, the expectation is that the mere presence of corporate of these independent directors on the board would lead to meet the expectations of all the stakeholders involved in the company. Now, the challenge which came before the government and IIC was how to build the capacity of these independent directors to fulfill the expectations. Now, independent directors are a diverse set of people, most experienced, most qualified particularly in India. And so what we, the design of the entire portal was premised on the idea that we induce professionalism amongst the independent directors. They are not a professional, they are trying to induce professionalism. And we started looking at what would be the components of this professionalism. And the components were five. First, it be a group of individuals who adhere to ethical standards, possess specialized knowledge and skills, and these are derived from research, training, and education of a higher standard. And finally, they are willing to apply these skills in the interest of others. So, this was the five fold path forms the foundation of the entire independent directors portal and the learning management system. How can we do it? We created a portal in which independent directors register and so we have this group of nearly 21,000 independent directors with us. This portal is based on an idea, a very standard idea and detailing of hub and scope, where the independent directors center in the Indian School of Corporation is the hub. And the spokes are of two varieties. One are the technical spokes, which is the cloud, the service provider. The other spokes are the partners who co-create knowledge, who enable us to deliver the best courses. The second part we did was about the learning. You know, recall in this five-fold part, there was that these people These people derive their, their competencies from research, training, education to the highest standards. So, the challenge before us was how to train such accomplished people who have, you know, done so much in their life. And so, we followed a principle called the bespoke principle, which is a very standard principle used in digital learning. And there are two elements to this principle. The first is self-learning, the second is self-testing. In our internal discussions, we came around and assumed that, we, that these independent directors are in different points of the learning curve in terms of skills, experience. 
So we, in order to click into that, we required customized courses for them. I created self learning by use of whatever way you are, take those modules, and then go in for a mock test and finally a test. The test was also, it's a self test, remotely doctored, nobody knows the scores. You take it in the comfort of your home. There is no fear, the fear of exams. And that, you know, taking exams at such an age, this is the, what we try to dispense. And this led to the bespoke model. How do our modules uh, sort of enable all this? We focus on two things. One is the know how, and second, the know what. The know what comes from basic principles of companies' law, city regulations, etc. The know how comes, how, as Janal Lawley is saying, how in an environment where somebody who's paying you, how do you maintain your independence? How do you give your objective? So, teaching your students are to know how, know how. Component ethics. We don't teach you the principles of ethics. All of us are aware. You need to do it in back of our mind. Of making ethical decisions and not making ethical decisions in an environment of ethical dynamics. Do we teach you to know why? Nietzsche said, if you know the why of things, the how takes care of themselves. We will be. Ethics can be best practiced in cultivated by a particular know how, and then you will take care of the know how. We require the drive to make those trade offs in fear of Let me this is apply these skills and for this, provide opportunities in the portal, portal to the office companies. And there are 1500 companies in this And once you understand your, your profile, you can shape the companies on some the data provides and this sort of thing. I would just like to say that in the last months since we launched the portal, around 1,000 independent directors have registered all of which was and the comments also registered on this platform. Bring about marriage with the independent directors and the company. I have a lot of distance to go. There are 5,000 listed companies and 2,000 companies in the world. And we know that this be a sort of a third company and lead to that in the way that has been on the world. That's not the beginning of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samir Sharma. Thank you. Thank you for that opening address. And uh, there are a lot of comments and feedback that was coming in in the comment chat box. Maybe you would like to read through it. All through that address, there were a lot of um, feedback comments that have been coming in. And before we move on to the inaugural address, I would like to make it known that we are. 847 strong right now. Um, uh, that's the kind of attendance that this first edition is receiving. And thank you all really for joining us. Um, moving on towards the inaugural address now, um, for which I would like to welcome Mr. UK Sinha, retired IAS, former chairman of SEBI, that is Securities and Exchange Board of India. 
Um, not just that, he's also a board member on multiple boards, and he's a visionary regulator himself. I'm sure all of you had heard about his book, Going Public, My Time at SEBI, which was released at the beginning of this year, and talks about the basic requirements of, for the functioning of an independent regulator and how accountability and independence go hand in hand. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. UK Sinha. Over to you, request you to please deliver the inaugural address. Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are, sir. Okay. You are. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, IOD and uh, IICA for inviting me today. I'd like to begin first by flagging an issue, and that is that during the COVID-19 period, a number of special dispensations have been given. For example, on disclosures, on extension of timeline for various activities, even electronic AGMs are being done. Timelines for the annual meeting or the AGM have been extended. All of these are perhaps justified because of the special situation that we have. But my worry is that it should not become the new normal for future. So I, 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 I would like to flag that the regulators and the MCA should be alert that as things normalize, we should go back to the old normal rather than uh, uh, succumb to any pressure from any group that this is the new norm. On the question of uh, 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 IDs, uh, uh, my first point is that it starts with the selection process of the IDs. And uh, uh, unfortunately, in my view, the, the selection process of independent directors uh, right now follows a practice of, uh, of uh, inviting people to a closed club. So what is the process being followed in selecting the independent directors? What is the role of other shareholders? These are neither disclosed nor recorded. And uh, we have example in other countries, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have the example that even, even uh, non-promoter directors have a say uh, uh, and and they can they can return back the uh, uh, recommendation in their meeting and then it has to be discussed after 90 days and things like that and why it is important for india is that uh, again unfortunately in spite of sebi's uh, uh, minimum public shareholding directive and others the percentage of promoter shareholding in companies has been going up I mean, it is it is counterintuitive. Ideally, this should have been coming down. But the data that I have, for example, of 31st of March 2020, uh, the promoter shareholding is around 44 percent, more than 44 percent. Whereas uh, in 2013, it was around 20 to 21 percent. Sorry, 30 to 31 percent. So this has been going up because of this particular factor. The process of appointment of independent directors, and I think MCA under their rulemaking power can do something about it. Some, similarly, SEBI can do something about it. So people should have confidence that a due process has been followed. Because once the selection is properly done, then only the question will be what to get best out of independent directors. The next point I would like to make is that uh, there have been several episodes in last two, three years which in the Indian context raise a red flag about, about the trustworthiness of uh, financial and non-financial data which is disclosed by the companies. Uh, we have several episodes, I, see, I do not name them here. So what it requires is that the audit committee has to function much more effectively and much more seriously. Uh, I think some of you would agree with me that there are examples when in the same day uh, and one hour meeting of the audit committee is held followed by an NRC meeting followed by the board meeting and by midday everything is over. The, the audit committee members, although it's prescribed in the rules that they should meet the auditors, but they have to ensure that this does not become a ritual and really uh, uh, important and intensive questions are asked to the auditors and i'd also argue that the audit committee members should also meet the cost auditors cost auditors also can bring out a number of important points about where a particular expenditure or particular cost is being booked and is it rightly being booked or not so that would be my point that uh, 
the the independent director have to be more cautious about about the uh, uh, about the uh, financial data and about the role in the audit committee and also their role in the risk management committee. And here I would like to request IICA that uh, uh, the training is a very good idea. Training has to be done, but let us also think training not as a means of testing whether somebody is fit or unfit, but we should go up to the next stage. That is, we should provide them some coaching, some opportunity where they can raise data, because most of the independent directors when they are selected are people who are eminent in their own field, but they may be, for example, not aware of uh, nuances of accounts keeping and how to examine uh, a balance sheet and, and things like that, or they may not be aware of what is the latest information or latest requirement from SEBI or MCA. So let us provide an environment in our training whereby they can be taught about this. They can, they can raise their questions. They would feel hesitant to raise these questions in front of the whole board. But in this training session, if we start facilitating their knowledge enhancement, that will be helpful. And I'm told that the IRDA has started a practice where those independent directors, those who are independent directors in the, in the insurance companies, for them, they have organized a separate training where the participants could raise all sorts of doubts and questions and that could be solved. So one small suggestion on how training can be oriented towards enhancing their knowledge. The next point I would like to make is that uh, we had some setback on, on the earlier uh, 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 earlier move to separate the chairman and managing director. Oh, and, and now a, a, a revised timeline has been prepared, but uh, uh, there is a need for a separate person presiding over the, over the board meeting and who is not himself the managing director. So I'll flag it as an issue on which there should be some uh, forward movement. Uh, the next point I would like to make is that uh, government, that we are not talking at all about the governance in the, in the PSUs, public sector undertakings. And government as the majority owner of these public sector undertakings is also as a, as a sovereign government uh, capable of framing rules or getting laws passed. So ideally, government as the majority owner of PSUs should be taking the lead in, in, in setting the pace for corporate governance. Unfortunately, uh, the, the governance in the public sector undertakings is, is falling behind the governance in the, in the privately owned uh, uh, companies. Uh, and this happens through a variety of ways. Most important is that the, that the act itself, the Companies Act or the rules frame under the Companies Act have several exemptions for public sector undertakings. Those might have been justified in the 70s and 80s, but there is a serious need to relook at it, that whether those things are required, for example, the liability of directors and things like that. Do we really need to keep them in a separate pedestal right now in 2020, or should we make a move? And another thing which is very apparent that uh, many of them continue to be defaulters in matters like uh, having women independent directors in their boards, or, or even the ratio of independent directors and non-independent directors, there some of the PSUs are falling behind. This does not uh, uh, speak very highly about the commitment of the government towards governance. So I would, I would, I would urge that we should, we should look at it seriously. And lastly, I would like to say that uh, uh, the, the uh, National guidelines on responsible business conduct uh, is something on which the independent directors have to be careful in their boards. Uh, many boards are not paying attention to long-term interest of the stakeholders. Uh, they go by the uh, quarterly or annual progress, but what is the value being created on a long-term basis for the stakeholders, and by stakeholders, I mean not only the shareholders, but all the other stakeholders. Uh, the world is moving in that direction, and the world is moving very seriously in that direction. And the MCA guidelines also point out that the government is also serious about it. So this is an area where without any prompting from the independent directors in the company boards, 
the executive management may not be very keen to move forward. So this is another area where I, I, I think the independent directors can play a role. I'll stop here and thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sinha. Thank you for your erudite address and all the suggestions and the observations that you made. Uh, we really value them. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Um, it's time we move on to the keynote part of the session, and it's time for me to invite our very first keynote speaker for the session, Mr. O.P. Bhatt. Now, Mr. O.P. Bhatt is the non-executive chairman, Greenco Group Holdings PLC, and independent director on the boards of Tata Consultancy Services Limited, that's TCS. Tata Motors Limited, Tata Steel Limited, Hindustan Unilever Limited, and others. And not just that, he's the former chairman of State Bank of India, where he led the bank as a visionary and a transformational leader. We all know the State Bank of India is the number one bank of India and also makes it to the Fortune Global 500 list of world's biggest corporations. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. O.P. Bhatt. So thank you. Am I audible? Am I unmuted? Can hear you, sir. Yes. Am I, am, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. A very good day to all the participants, considering that you are spread from good morning and good afternoon to good evening areas of the world. And I must thank my fellow panelists because I agree completely with everything that they have said. But then since this is about independent directors and how independent directors can contribute towards better corporate governance in boards, the spirit is that you know a dissent cannot be treated with disloyalty or disservice. So you know I will add a few things to what have been said and maybe also give it a different flavor. <clears throat> so since this is about independent directors, a lot of is, has been said about you know structural issues, legal issues, technical issues we have talked about you know committees about uh, uh, diversity about attendance about compensation etc but all these are structural issues and while these are important very important but i think we will be fighting the wrong war if you were to simply tighten all the rules for the boards and ignore what is vital and what i think is vital in our world is social cohesion the right mindset commitment curiosity, care, collaboration, and other centeredness, which means it doesn't matter who gets the credit for a decision or something right that has happened in the board. But what is more important is that the board or the company collectively gets it right. The ability to trust and challenge your colleagues on the board and the ability to be a friend, a well-wisher, a coach, and a mentor to the CEO and his team. So I think you know these are very important attributes of an independent director. I think, and I have met a large number of independent directors, and all those who have, I have met, very experienced, very qualified, very knowledgeable in their respective fields. They are all doyles, you know. They come to the board with 20, 30, 40 years of experience, you know. They come with a lot of eminence with them, right? And yet, when you come to the board, whether you are able to gel as a team, whether you are able to dissent and dissent agreeably so, whether you are able to persuade, whether you are able to make a mark by your thought process, that is something which I have not found everywhere. And the reason for this is very simple. You know, all of us who are directors, myself included, over the time that we gather this experience and this eminence of which we become very proud and for which we become, we become very wanted in certain years, you know, it builds a certain mindset. You know, I say certain things and people agree or follow. There is a certain, you know, mindset which is coming from command and influence. In the board, what you need is, you know, persuasion, influence, collaboration. You can't say things and it will happen. In the board, you have to redefine what is work, what is leadership, what is success, what is guilt, what is discipline. And from a specialist, which is what you are, when I mean, you may be leading an IT company or you may be leading a bank as I was, from a specialist, you have to become a no. So this is a huge mindset 
change or a mindset shift which people don't talk about which people are not aware which most directors assume that because they have done so much in their life and rightly so because they have acquired a position of excellence and rightly so and therefore if they are on a board which may be smaller than their earlier company or whatever it is you know they are qualified to sit there yes they are qualified to sit there but to be successful there and to be able to contribute there effectively there is a mindset shift that is required to take place which i think is not happening everywhere and is not happening adequately just to give you an example you know does an independent director know who am i really working for am i working for the chairman the ceo the board the shareholder who am i working for we need to have clarity to the answer to this question because that will define the mindset that you have when you engage in the board what are my rights and privileges as a director and more importantly what are my duties and obligations how many people know that the duty of a director the most important duty of a director is the duty of care c a r e care to the company candor candor to the shareholders loyalty this is not written in any regulation or in a law anywhere but you will find that the the, the best directors perform these duties and the and these duties are sort of implied in every regulation every law every case that you will think but you know this is not very well known and how as an independent director i measure my impact on the board on the board decisions on the company on the outcomes in the company what is happening to the company what really matters to me as an independent director is it compensation is it attendance is it social prestige is it the networking that i do or is it something else what is that something else that matters to me because i am an independent director of so and so company how proud do i feel that i am an independent director of so and so company and why do i feel proud who benefits from my interventions in the board and why so some of these things these are you can say i mean i am repeating this word mindset 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 these are mindset issues but i think and i have been on the on you know after state bank of india where i was on the board for 5 years i have been on boards in the private sector both domestically and internationally for another 10 years and i have been some of the most marquee boards and this is some of the learning that i have and therefore just to go ahead in a little technical way and then i'll stop i agree with what mr sinha said and i also agreed with mr sharma and general alwalia about various things that they have said so for example selection selection is important but you know a selection has to be very broad based the nrc each member of the nrc must interact with the potential candidate maybe you need to hide a higher head hunter and the idea is not to select an appropriate director for the board the idea is to see the fit of that person to the board so there are two ways you have to see the fit one is that collectively all the directors what is the competence qualification and experience that they bring to the board is it relevant to the issues that face the company that is one fitment that you have to see but the other fitment that you have to see that whether this person will gel in into the board whether he will fit into the board psychologically sociologically you know interactions interpersonal this that and that i think in a board this is a very important fit so when you don't take a person as a director it is not that you are rejecting him it is simply that you know the fit is not suitable he may be better in some other board so you are not rejecting anybody but you are selecting somebody for your board because you want the right fit then on boarding again mr sira mentioned a lot of things that should be done on a boarding you know like teaching about financial statements and things like that but i think i'll give you an example which is no longer a secret you know i was i worked in state bank for almost 40 years i was chairman for about 5 years and after that i joined the international board of standard chartered bank so a, a banker for 40 years five years as chairman of one of the largest banks in the world and the standard chartered bank gave me 45 sessions of induction each session lasting 2 to 3 hours initially i thought what is this happening why why are they doing this i mean i know everything but as i went through those sessions i realized how much i did not know and how much which i knew was not relevant to standard chartered and how much i need to know to become a more effective contributor on the board of standard chartered 45 lessons of induction there is not one company in india which gives even 10 or 5 of late some of them are giving at least i make a noise in every company that i am that we need to induct directors we need to orient them we need to onboard them we need to tell them about the company so that is one thing that we need to do 
and this has to be an ongoing education after onboarding maybe every month every three months every six months there is something new happening all the time either in the area of you know regulation or in the area of law or in the area of competition or technology or markets or business or job politics or environment something is happening all the time and the director needs to be updated and educated and that is the job which the company or the board has to do then the director needs to familiarize themselves with the key personnel in the company so it is not only those who sit on the board the ceo the chairman will maybe one or two executive full time executive directors there are many other key personnel in the company you need to know who they are the chief technology officer the chief human resources officer the chief marketing officer you know in different companies the key personnel will be different then there may not be too many two three four five six eight you need to know who they are you need to visit sites you need to visit offices you need to visit distribution you need to visit supply chain you need to understand all of these things and maybe when you visit these things you come and report to the board what you have learned because that will ensure that your visits will be you know, fruitful productive useful so that we have really learned something so this is some of the things which i think we as independent directors should take it upon ourselves to do nobody will do it for us we have to do it for ourselves and just one minute i will take on the board in the board i think the most important thing is excuse me agenda management we need to have an annual calendar of topics we need to prioritize those topics you know so different companies at different time they may be different priority succession planning could be priority at one time capex could be at another time technology could be at a third time strategy could be at a fourth time or whatever it is so we need to have an annual calendar we need to have all the topics that we think we should do and we should prioritize those topics so that they come up early or they also come up frequently then we need to have a meaningful strategy session most companies have a strategy session once a year in these days when things are changing so rapidly even competition is changing when technology is changing when innovation is changing and you have a strategy session once a year maybe you need to have it twice a year i don't know different companies will take a different view but at least we need to think about it and then evaluation you know there is a ritual of board evaluation which many companies do some of them do it themselves some of them get an outside expert agency to do it i think meaningful and intelligent reviews and evaluations are very helpful to the board and to the independent directors to know what are their blind spots where is it that they need to you know come abreast or improve themselves so that their contribution to the board becomes more effective and i am i am a big votary of these evaluations but of course for these evaluations to be meaningful and correct there has to be trust right there has to be faith there has to be belief and there has to be good will so that is the other thing that uh, you know an intelligent evaluation and then to get right and timely inputs from the company if you are not getting demand ask shout make noise you need inputs from the company and you need inputs from the company not only about the company as domain but also those in the macro area which affect it it could be something like sustainability it could be something something has happened in america which impacts the company in india now these inputs could come by way of memos by way of emails by way of telephone calls by way of a quick impromptu meeting or whatever it is but the idea is that the independent directors need to remain engaged not only during the board meeting but throughout their tenure in the board 3 years 5 years 10 years whatever it about you know with the company with the company's products and with the company's ecosystem otherwise their contribution is not going to be affected so i'll stop here and i you know i focused only on the independent directors because the title was how the independent directors can bring better governance and i think they cannot bring better governance unless they improve themselves on a host of areas some of which which i listed so i'll stop here and thank you very much thank you so much nikhil for such a well versed uh, address and there are so many comments and feedback that has come for you with uh, please take some time out and read them and it was great to hear you drawing from your vast experience and sharing all the insights that you did thank you so much before we move on to the next keynote speaker i would like to bring to everyone's notice that right now we are 916 strong in attendance it's great to see people from various parts of the globe joining us in such good strength um and now i would like to invite on my next keynote speaker uh, mr raminder s gujral retired ias he's an independent director on the boards of reliance industries limited geo platforms limited adani power limited adani green energy limited and adani power mutra limited and former secretary finance ministry of finance government of india he is a very distinguished civil servant and has held various important uh, posts in the central government 
um, and has varied experience spanning across 37 years of service. Thank you so much, Mr. Bajral, for uh, making time out for this very edition of the dialogue. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the earlier speakers have already covered nearly about 70-80% of what uh, probably needs to be said. I would just quickly mention Mr. Sena having mentioned, highlighted the importance of selection of the IDs, trustworthiness of financial data, and the importance of the audit committee, the importance of training of the IDs, the segregation of the post of chairman and MD, and the less than uh, required governance currently in the PSUs. No dispute on all of these points. Mr. Bhatt has gone uh, beyond and said with reference to the boards that every independent director must have the right mindset in order to be really effective. There must be good commitment. He must be able to question and challenge the management, but simultaneously be collaborative. He highlighted the issue of training and during the board meetings to ensure that you prioritize various subjects which need to be discussed over the year. Again, absolutely to the point, uh, what does it leave for me? Let me say that uh, coming on a point which has been mentioned by both, first and foremost is that if you have to better contribute in the board, you must understand the business of the company 100%. You must understand the industry in which that company is. And like Mr. Bhatt said, let me add, in Reliance for the first seven, eight months, I had to visit all sites, discuss with all uh, management heads of different functions. And I can say that even today, after having been on the board for about five and a half years, I don't think I understand more than maybe about 30 to 40% of the business. But uh, if you don't make that effort to even understand the business, I assure you, you will never be able to contribute in the board. While you are doing that understanding and learning, you must learn to also do an internal SWOT analysis of that company. And particularly, try and understand what are the weaknesses and the possible risks, whether it is in the financial area, whether it is technical, or even technological, because various uh, industries, they may be technological obsolescence. So those issues need to be really understood. And if they are not really addressed, then you must ensure that you keep highlighting those issues till they are satisfactorily addressed, at least in your mind. Now, vis-a-vis -vis individual aspects. Important aspects which I mentioned about IDs are that, yes, you have a lot of liability also under the uh, company act because now it is an issue of your knowledge and uh, even if you have not attended a meeting you could still be liable for the decision perfectly right the fact is that as an independent director there is a great probability that you would be on the audit committee since uh, in a majority of the companies two-thirds of the independent directors have to be there in the audit committee, if not majority. So what Mr. Bhatt mentioned, that in the training of independent directors, there must be certain element of even being able to understand the financial uh, ratios of in basic elements of financial questions which you need to raise in the board. What are those areas where 
there could be a slip and which you definitely need to raise. Mr. Bhatt mentioned that you must uh, prioritize and spread discussions over the year. I would add that uh, major subsidiaries must always be discussed in every board meeting. Whether it is half an hour for each major subsidiary, it must be discussed. That is a very important aspect. And uh, particularly where it is going to say, contribute to more than 25% of the revenue or profit, you have to ensure that the meeting focuses and devotes time on discussion for those major subsidiaries. The operation, the finances, as well as utilization of funds of those subsidiaries. And don't leave it only on a point that it's a wholly owned subsidiary, and therefore, there is no need to look into that matter. Even if it's a wholly owned subsidiary, you definitely need to look into the proper utilization of fund. Uh, periodically, you must question about any impairment of assets or investments of the company. But the company may not be, or the management may not be forthcoming on its own to examine that aspect because of an issue of profitability. You as an independent director must always be able to question that are there any contingent liabilities which have not been accounted for or at the very least where a detailed note in accounts is not provided regarding those contingent liabilities. As an independent director again, you must question whether there has been any change in policy. Of course, the auditor will also look into that. The statutory auditor will also make a remark on that. But still, as an independent director, you must ask whether there is any change in policy, whether it is accounting, valuation of inventory, etc. And if so, why? And what is the implication, financial implication? Also mentioned was that the minority shareholders interest must be looked into keep that at the back of the mind because as uh, mentioned by mr bhatt you have to have the right mindset and commitment and be collaborative while you need to question you must never forget that the primary interest has to be the company's interest the management also would respect you for your questions as long as they know that your primary interest is the interest of the company. Now, that is an aspect one must never forget. And again, towards the end, I would say that not everything gets done in the boardroom. Committees are very important. As I mentioned, audit committee is the most important. And if you are a member, you need to be very particular in examining. I didn't mention about the RPTs. RPTs are the most important. So if there is ever any mischief in any company, it is always in the related party transactions. And you as an independent director must be willing to question each related party transaction to confirm that it is in the normal course of business and it is at arm's length. If it is not at arm's length, you definitely need to question. And uh, my experience over the last five and a half years has been that whatever you question, and if you are right, and when the management knows that you are speaking for the interest of the company, they will always agree with you and make amendment wherever required so that your doubts are always put at rest. Therefore, finally, I would say only to all the independent directors that have commitment when you are joining as an independent director. What Mr. Alu Alia said, that there is a problem of dependent independent directors. You must be very clear in your conscience as to why you are joining as an independent director. Is it only for that remuneration? 
is it for the position and my only answer to you is you have your conscience you must be able to answer to that and you must be able to raise the relevant question while not being antagonistic in the board be collaborative but be always there to challenge the management on every question thank you thank you so much gushwal needless to say you heard the applause there for you thank you so much for sharing your insights drawing on your vast experience and sharing all your observations and suggestions on the issue of independent directors thank you so much thank you there are lots of comments appreciating your presentation i request you to please go through them in the chat will really like them moving on i would like to invite my next keynote speaker for the session that's dr punita kumar sinha dr punita kumar sinha phd cfa investment professional and board member independent director on the boards of infosys limited lupin limited jsw steel limited rallis india limited and governor on the board of cfa institute and the research foundation board of trustees managing partner pacific paradigm advisors boston india and chairperson incred anc dr kumar sena has 25 years of uh, experience in investment management and financial markets and um she's been instrumental in projecting the prospects and um the projections of asia as an investment destination um extensive knowledge of global economies and understanding of india's policy issues and i'm sure it will be deeply enriching to hear her drawing on her vast experience and also i would like all of you to know that she will be having a fireside chat with the chairman of the session a little later though for now let's invite dr punita kumar sinha for the keynote session please uh thank you ritika thank you to everybody else who's joined today's session to listen to all of us and it's a privilege to be part of such a distinguished um uh, group of panelists of course we've heard a lot of uh, wise uh, ideas uh, from them uh, so i'm going to take a slightly different um, approach to my discussion given my global experience and given that i have invested in many of these country uh, companies in my past life um i felt that i should give some kind of an comparison to how i see indian uh, independent directors versus what i've seen in my experience globally so when i fir uh, my first board in india i joined in 2012 and uh, when i was going to join um, the indian board a lot of my colleagues in the us and even some in india were very apprehensive and i was a little apprehensive frankly because i had um, as an investor had quite a, my own share of run in with promoters who actually um did not uh, take you know uh, look after minority shareholder interests and had done a lot of things that got them and us to lose a lot of money in their investments so um there was a lot of fear and i wasn't sure what indian corporate governance would be like but it was an experience that i wanted to have and plus i wanted to bring my global perspectives to indian companies so i said okay i will start and see how it goes and i must say i have been very pleasantly surprised um by what our regulators have done and what the companies act has provided uh, in terms of roles and responsibilities for independent directors in fact in many many areas we are um, as good as um, some of our global um, standards um, and in some areas we are ahead of the global standards so i just wanted to give some examples of where i where we are actually doing quite well uh, and areas where we are ahead and then some areas where we perhaps are behind So um you know if you uh, look at some of the uh, um rules that have been put in the companies act and by regulators rotation of auditors that's uh, up to our global standards um business responsibility reporting um that's global standards um to have uh, women independent directors um on every board that's ahead of many global uh, countries in fact Uh, many countries don't have uh, any women um, directors on their boards in fact i've invested in korean companies and when i talk to them and i say why don't you have women on your boards and they said we just don't have enough senior women in the pipeline to put them on boards but they're just becoming aware but india fortunately it had many uh, women who were uh, in senior positions so there was no shortage of uh, bringing women on to uh, boards um, tenure of boards is now you know 1 uh, 5 year term 
um, term and then another five year term. So that also is a very good standard because it makes sure that directors um, don't become, as someone said, dependent independent directors and they do maintain their independence. And after 10 years, perhaps they get too close to the company and so they should rotate out and go to another board. Uh, we have, um, you know, uh, significant scrutiny of related party transactions in our audit committee, similar to what happens globally. Uh, we have um, a lot of mandatory disclosures. We have lead independent directors. Again, some countries have lead, lead independent directors and some countries don't have lead independent directors. Some countries have executive committee of the board. Um, the executive committee of the board is not mandatory in India, but the lead independent director is mandatory. We have performance evaluations very similar to what I've seen happen in um, other global companies. And um, areas where I think we are actually ahead is that um, for CapEx proposals, um, we are required in India um, to, that the minority shareholders are the ones that vote on it and not the promoters. So I think that's a fairly stringent criteria, which is not um, available in a lot of other countries. Most other countries don't have a CSR committee of the board. In India, we have a CSR committee of the board and that's mandatory. And I think India has done a great job in terms of mandating 2% of profits to be put towards CSR and social responsibility. And I think that makes um, India look very good in terms of social responsibility. And I think um, it was, uh, if India had not put that 2%, I suppose companies would not have uh, put so much money towards CSR. Um, in fact, uh, in the US, only 6% of the companies have CSR committees. In India, every board has to have a CSR committee. Um, in India, we have stakeholders relationship committees, which again is unique. Very few countries have stakeholder relationship committees. I chair a number of them in India. And um, I must say that I, as I heard from other um, distinguished panelists, while we have stakeholders committees, we don't really, uh, we don't really address the uh, needs of all stakeholders as mandated by the Companies Act and the regulators. So I think that is something I'll come to. Uh, we do have executive sessions, um, uh, which uh, most countries have. We have ind uh, independent directors meetings separate from management, again, up to global standards. And of course, we have very experienced global, uh, I mean, very experienced people on our boards. And when we bring global directors, um, they don't necessarily add more in terms of governance capability, but they do bring the global perspective. Uh, because I think now in India, we have evolved into putting in uh, several, several requirements that make our standards as best um, as they can be. Um, in areas, I would say that we uh, perhaps have erred too much on the side of regulation. I think, in fact, um, by putting in all these rules, we've become a little bit too regulated. Um, for instance, I would say that I have not seen um, video recordings um, mandated in any country. In fact, in many other boards, you just join in by phone and you record your attendance. You can, you don't even need to be on video. You don't have to always be present for every meeting. In India, you have to not only do the video recording, you have, you know, a whole series of things that you have to um, say that you are uh, alone in the room and um, and that you are um, uh, receive the agenda and I can, you can see and hear everyone clearly. I've not seen that in any other country but it is perhaps to prevent people from faking attendance. Um, so I think in India, because there is lack of trust, we tend to overregulate, and that's what we seem to have done here. Again, for CSR, 2%, um, you can go to jail um, if you're on the, you know, if you haven't spent 2% um, on your CSR. Again, very strict rule. I haven't seen that happen in any countries. Um, while we put in the whistleblower um, policies, and those are great, and we've been receiving a lot of whistleblower complaints in some of the boards that I've been on, and in fact, that has helped us find, um, discover fraud in some of the companies. So it's a great um, uh, protection for our shareholders, but uh, we don't have protection, um, uh, a protection act yet that has been passed in India. So while whistleblowers um, can speak, they are not fully protected and they, uh, so there could be retaliation. So I think that um, that we need to do more of. Again, in India, um, we've taken the view, um, the government has taken the view 
that uh, there should be no shares given of the company to um, independent directors, which is quite unusual. Only, uh, I mean, in most countries, a lot of countries, the belief is that independence and ownership are not necessarily um, the same thing. And in fact, um, it is good to get the independent directors aligned by uh, owning shares because then they will take into int uh, interest the views of all shareholders because they themselves are a shareholder as well and will participate in the growth of the company and focus on it. Um, I think uh, this actually particularly hurts our startups and smaller companies in India because they don't have the financial strength to often attract the best independent directors um, and pay them um, what is required. Um, and in, in, in the past, they would give them shares, but now that's not allowed. So I think it does affect governance of smaller companies and startups. And, and frankly, a lot of directors then don't join mid cap and small cap companies. And that's where you need to have more governance. So you need to find a way to compensate the directors so that they'll join a company regardless necessarily of its size, but for where they think they can have the most impact. I think the liability on our directors is very, very high. Again, um, often I've heard from uh, board councils that you shouldn't, I've heard from some board members that you should be really, really engaged uh, with the company. Uh, but our board councils often tell us that don't get too involved with management issues because there are issues that the management needs to deal with and the issues that the independent directors need to deal with. And the more you get involved with management, the more liable you are and therefore you have less protection. So there, there needs to be some kind of a solution to where is the role of the independent director end and where does management's role begin? So there is not enough clarity on the separation of those roles. Um, also in India, we have exams and the institute itself is going to be uh, administering exams that I have not seen in any other country where you have to take an exam to be an independent director. So um, while you know, companies do offer training resources, but nobody is required to take exams. Um, and I think uh, this 50, uh, while um, Companies Act have mandated that you should have more, you know, at least 50% independent directors, a lot of companies are exceeding that, but very, uh, a lot of companies also just stay at the 50-50. So, um, and I think a lot of um, uh, other, uh, you know, while we have really good rules, how we implement them depends a lot on the ownership and the nature of the company. And uh, some of our ownership structures in India are quite unique. Um, India has many, many companies that are owned by promoters and there's been a very big concentration of ownership. So there are many more companies where, where owners and promoters have like 40 to 50% of the ownership, which again, in a lot of developed markets, the ownership is quite well dispersed amongst a large number of shareholder groups. So, so if you have a chairman of the board who comes from a promoter group, um, you can see that the role of the independent director and the culture of that board is different than if you have a board which um, is you know, very professionally uh, managed and owned by a large number of shareholders. So I've been fortunate that I've been on boards of different kinds. I've been on boards of companies where there's a large promoter group. I've been on um, boards of companies which have been very professional in terms of uh, even their ownership structures are uh, very widely spread. And so that gives a different nature um, of how the independent directors um, view their responsibilities. Then recently in India, we've seen a lot of companies uh, getting backed by private equity and the nature of how independent directors and the promoter in that case, not necessarily promoter, but the large group concentration is with the private equity. And again, that changes the dynamic in the boardroom. Um, and then finally, um, you know, you have in India uh, also a large number of corporate groups like the Tata's and the Mahindra's. And when you're part of boards of large corporate groups, the independent director's role again is slightly different. So for instance, in the nomination committees of these corporate groups, there's a large, um, you know, a, um, a large amount of uh, uh, guidance that you get from the group. Uh, in terms of the compensation levels that they have across companies, the rules and regulations they have. So, so you have to um, kind of rely to some extent on the practices that the corporates have. And so again, the nature of the committee and uh, the nature of the independent directors interaction um, uh, with each other and with management changes to some extent. 
So it's also very imperative that the chairperson of the board um, tries to make sure that the independent, they bring out the best in terms of independent directors and that they do um, like um, to, you know, bring in diverse viewpoints. And um, unless they do that, very often um, I find that um, our culture, and, and, and I noticed that again, and I've, I've been on global boards and I've been on um, Indian boards, that there are cultural differences and that also come into play how independent directors um, act their role. In India, we of course have a lot of respect for elders. There is a lot more um, hierarchy, uh, hierarchy in India. There is a lot of respect and almost um, all of the promoters and founders. Um, it's not a culture that uh, encourages speaking up and being an independent thinker. So if you stand up and speak up, too much. I don't think a lot of independent directors and uh, uh, you know, boards in general like that. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, you know, uh, the um, this culture. You know, uh, we can train people as much, but there is a cultural element that we have to keep in mind as we uh, become independent um, directors. Now, um, I've seen um, that India has come a long way. Um, in terms of uh, improving its governance, but the perception outside of India is still that there are still a lot of scams and maybe governance in India is not good. So I think we need to change that perception. And um, I think one of the ways we can do that is also the stakeholders committees that we have on our boards. Uh, we uh, currently, um, ma as mandated by the Companies Act and the regulator, it's very narrowly focused on just small shareholder complaints like my shares haven't become DMAT or I have lost my share certificate, but it doesn't encompass the whole um, stakeholder ecosystem. And uh, shareholder active uh, engagement with our stakeholders through some kind of a forum will give um, them a better understanding of what independent directors are doing and give um, uh, them a better perception of what Indian governance is all about and also will help independent directors um, gain perspectives uh, from them. And we started doing that in some of our companies, but it's not mandated. Some companies are progressively doing that. I would say that, um, you know, I'm, since we have to have a fireside chat as well, so I'm going to leave some time for that. Um, as I um, look ahead, I think I'm very optimistic about uh, India's um, governance and the role of the independent directors. And we've already come a long way, and I think uh, we're going to keep improving, and uh, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Panita. Thank you for that very, very well-informed address. We clearly had lots to learn from you and looking forward to your advice and chat um, uh, with the chairman of the session a little later. Um, thank you to all the keynote speakers who shared the valuable insights with us. And I'm sure um, each one of us has a lot to take away um, after hearing all of you in this very first edition of the series. It's time we now move on to a very special address by Dr. Neeraj Gupta. Now, Dr. Neeraj Gupta is the head of School of Corporate Governance and Public Policy and Nodal Officer, Center for Independent Directors, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India. Dr. Gupta is part of IICA and has been entrusted by the ministry to ensure strong governance through inviolable frameworks. And he's on a mission to bring continuous improvement for which he's actually building a data bank of independent directors to make sure that they are strengthened and empowered further. Uh, we would like to say, Dr. Gupta, that IOD is with you in this mission. We welcome you all for this special address. Let me begin a very good evening to uh, all of you and uh, especially uh, the panelist speakers. Uh, in fact, it is uh, very challenging for me after hearing from uh, the galaxy of speakers, uh, uh, the experienced professionals sitting on the reputed boards to pitch in in terms of my ideas. But there are a few issues I would like to uh, place before you. Uh, I understand uh, out of the discussions which have taken place that corporate boards are under increasingly under pressure for enhancing and diversifying their ranks. 
adding more women adding more independent directors as well as executive directors with different cultural and functional backgrounds to represent the people who work in the organization and serve but the bar in fact to my view for the readiness of the board especially when we are undergoing the pandemic times the readiness of the board for such crisis situations as well as for those areas which are emerging areas as uh, uh, mr sinha has very rightly pointed out in terms of the recent voluntary code of uh, uh, ngrbc national guidelines for responsible business conduct which urges the corporate sector to be more responsible and more responsive definitely we need to think in terms of board readiness and for making the board ready because we scrutinize the directors in terms of their abilities to understand more uh, complex business models uh, demonstrating various technical know how delivering and discharging their roles for the higher bars of corporate governance it's a great opportunity in fact of course we have borrowed this concept of independent directors from outside to choose and wisely select independent directors who comes with those diverse skills and knowledge sets which can really make the board ready so that's the first thing which i would like to see and in terms of making the board ready and preparing this new set of professionals it has always been a commitment of indian institute of corporate affairs and ministry of corporate affairs for uh, you know envisioning a higher uh, or better landscape of corporate governance in the country to empower the institutions and independent director being one of the important institution as our dg has also mentioned uh, we have worked hard on initiating with a platform which can really contribute in terms of preparing the set of professionals what i understand and what i was hearing from uh, the 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 reverended group uh, of course we have two set of professionals as of course we have multi set of companies the uh, top 100 uh, companies uh, based on their market capitalization uh, there are mid cap companies there are small cap companies and there is a governance challenge and governance question for all sets of companies so we need a big uh, pool of trained and professionally trained rather i would say professionals so in wake of this an initiative has been taken for creating this repository so that they could be enticed towards uh, developing an understanding towards what is really essential for them to contribute in the board which makes the board ready not only for the smaller organizations but for the bigger organizations at the same time and also to uh, learn those skills which are a really need of the hour if we look at the challenge as mr sinha was identifying towards the role of audit committees and the independence of independent directors while chairing the uh, audit committee and engaging with the um, uh, you know agenda similarly mr bhat has also mentioned about really articulating the agenda and making an annual plan and identifying those activities where uh, uh, you know some concurrent or repetitive discussion should take place based on the priority so definitely independent directors need to be exposed towards those areas either they be related to uh, develop their financial understanding or understanding towards the strategic issues understanding towards their roles and responsibilities setting the right culture and tone in the organization while working with a team because it is a collaborative effort as mr bust has very rightly mentioned couple of c's that they need to act with uh, with courage they need to uh, look for collaboration there need to be uh, conviction there need to be courage on their part to perform in a more ethical and uh, an integratiful way Uh, looking at the uh, within the legislative and uh, and the regulatory framework so this initiative has been uh, brought up and for that particular uh, uh, reason different modules have been provided which is a new beginning altogether because uh, india being a country having around 6000 listed companies uh, as our dg has rightly mentioned in more than 20000 companies which are 
required to appoint independent directors whereas no single platform available which can really in a collective way address to their uh, requirements in two way one the standard requirements which we are addressing by way of providing these modules and the specific requirements because uh, uh, there is larger requirement of their induction and as mr sinha has pointed out uh, we need to provide for some coaching so of course moving towards that uh, developing and offering this platform as a platform for more engage, en engagement and more interaction with the experts like you definitely is a step towards coaching and as the next step we have many more plans where we will be working on those areas and some personalized coaching sessions or maybe by segmenting uh, you know the directors in terms of their requirements based on their present skills and the skills which are required to make them future ready or board ready uh, uh, will definitely be there. So that's another point I would like to say. Third point which I would like to mention, I would like to quote here uh, Colin Mayer uh, who influence, influences me too much and he has authored a couple of books. So uh, what is the biggest challenge of the day for the corporate is to focus on the purpose and so does for the independent director. So uh, somebody was raising a question how independent directors are selected or how people should collect, select companies at the time of onboarding, whether they should accept the offer or not. So definitely independence is a big challenge, which is often uh, tested on the touchstone of legislative and regulatory framework, whatever provisions have been made for deciding about their independence. But independence itself is an issue of mindset. And independence goes beyond it because there are a couple of issues still at the global level we see where the researches are going on as to what extent the independence can be desired because dealing with the insider trading issues, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, different stakeholders while working in, uh, you know, widely held companies or closely held companies is again a big challenge. And we had been looking in the past, in the recent past, that a lot of... Uh, 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 you know, incidents have taken place uh, around the inside of trading and SEBI has also taken initiatives on tightening of the provisions. So, yes, independence is a big question and there is a big challenge in front of independent directors as to how tactically or strategically they deal with those issues while balancing different stakeholders and doing justice uh, um, uh, for keeping the interest of the corporation at the highest possible level. So that's another part. The third part where I would like to uh, focus on uh, in this discussion, because we have thousands of independent directors participating today, uh, it is a question of, uh, uh, you know, purpose for independent directors and uh, the professionals who are eyeing for uh, taking this up as a profession should again be very focused and clear as to what is their objective of uh, entering to this profession because it is the purpose which helps us gaining those skills and definitely if the professionals will not be clear about their central objective as to what sort of difference they really want to make in the boards uh, definitely we will not be having a good supply of truly independent and truly committed independent directors who can work uh, with higher level of ethics and integrity so that's another point the fourth point which I would like to make is, uh, uh, as I was referring uh, in the initial of my talk about the bar of board readiness, it is a question of individual skills and collective skills because an individual may come up with a skill, but when it comes to the question of working in a team, it is the question how we complement each other, how collectively we set that culture where, uh, as Mr. Bhatt was very beautifully mentioning that it is not the question of taking credit it's a question of uh, you know having a good decision after a good uh, uh, discussion within the board so the professionals need to be very very careful in terms of their own individual skills what they really bring to the board and boards on the other hand should also look at as to how the collective skills could be gathered and that's the only way we can make our indian boards ready for facing uh, the crisis uh, the climate challenge issues, the issues which are upcoming in form of data uh, uh, privacy and security, the issues of uh, or the challenges of, uh, uh, you know, uh, insider trading. And definitely, 
uh, independent directors uh, will have to take individual and collaborative action uh, to act as a police uh, at times, to act as uh, data junkies also, because data is the new oil and uh, it is often quoted. But the question is how effectively uh, we use the data and how effectively we eye for the right set of data is again very, very important. They also need to act uh, as an architect because they have to build the boards for tomorrow. That's the only way of sustainable uh, business ventures in the country and the country could produce those companies which are admired globally and could eye for more positions in the Fortune 500. And finally, uh, our independent directors also need to have, as we see, they have a larger oversight role and every time it is uh, propagated that they need to focus on the big picture. They need to, uh, uh, you know, be able uh, to envision uh, from 35,000 feet like a pilot where uh, they can uh, really, uh, you know, look, not just look around, but to look beyond the walls sensing the uh, what is likely and unlikely, uh, sensing the level of risks and taking proactive actions so that the institutions, the boards uh, uh, could emerge sustainable, uh, ready for the future and contributory for the growth of uh, the country. So with this, uh, uh, these objectives in mind, in fact, I can speak for more uh, but I know uh, there are many more speakers uh, waiting for their turn. So uh, with these objectives, we have come up with this initiative. Uh, the traction has been very good. The response is very encouraging. And it helps us, uh, you know, keeping alive every time under our present leadership and with the support of ministry all the time uh, to think new means and ways as to how we can place our interventions which can really contribute, shape up this profession, infuse more professionalism in their practice uh, for a better landscape of corporate governance in country. So that's all from my side. Uh, over to Ritika. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj Gutta. And all we can say is that IOD is with you in your mission. Thank you so much. Um, moving on, I would like now to invite the chairman of the program, Mr. Shailesh Vihari Bhakti, FCA to chair and preside over the rest of the program. And of course, we are awaiting the Q&A session because there are just a lot of questions coming in. Uh, but before that, I would like to formally introduce him. Um, he is the chairman of Mumbai Institute of Directors, India. He is chairman on boards of Blue Star Limited, LNT Finance Holdings Limited, LNT Mutual Fund Trustee Limited, Future Lifestyle Fashions Limited and NSTL e Governance Infrastructure Limited, and Independent Director on the boards of Bennett Coleman and Company Limited Times Group, Mahindra Life Spaces Developers Limited, Ambuja Cements Limited, ACC Limited, and others, and Chairman to New Hari Bhakti Business Services LLP. And we must add that he's one of the greatest supporters of IOD's mission and has been with us. Um, lending his support for many years now, and we're truly, truly grateful to him for that. Over to you, Mr. Hari Bhakti. Thank you very much, Ritika. And let me begin by acknowledging that I'm completely mesmerized by the depth, the breadth, the simply wonderful feast of ideas that we've already had. And to prove it, let me show you just the dense notes that I have taken from everybody's talks. Um, what I'm going to do in the next three to five minutes is to bring this to uh, some sort of a actionable agenda for all of us as independent directors and actually carve out a path that we can transform the performance of corporate India. So let me and I'm, I'm not going to attribute to anybody, please pardon me for that, but I'm building from everything that has been said. So I'm going to start with the attributes that one needs to have as an independent director. You need to be a guide, a mentor, a coach, no doubt. I think that humility of participation and that idea that you need to put yourself in a position when not only do you participate and contribute, but you make the change happen. That is what makes you a guide, a mentor, or a coach. You're also the conscience keeper of the corporation. 
and there are so many ethical and other issues which which need to be taken care of the minority shareholders issue the issue of making sure that the environment is not damaged the social responsibility the csr all of that that's the conscious keep conscience keeper role of an independent of an independent director then there is the role of being an innovator and making sure that innovation is actually encouraged through the entire tenure that you spend on any board because today without being an innovator you are likely to get disrupted and therefore the role that you need to play is see if you can make your board and your company that you are serving a disruptor instead of being a disrupted corporation you need to be a skill enhancer an encourager of leadership that can thrive that can build that can take people to the next level and for that you need passion you need discipline you need to be able to follow your dream and you need to be able to make other people follow their dreams and encourage them and make sure that your feedback is such that people will be encouraged to come to the board share with it give you the full transparency that you and we all demand that needs a phenomenal amount of encouragement creation of an open space otherwise people will not come and talk about it and therefore so important to do all of this in your role as an independent director then i'd like to say what is it that you can do to make a corporation future ready and for that you need to bring to the board that you serve three capitals of your own one your own knowledge capital which has to be built from your domain which has to be built from your knowledge of the world from your knowledge of the business as mr gujral pointed out so beautifully so important to know the external environment and the business environment but it's important to have that knowledge capital the knowledge capital you have to build and for that the number of hours you spend outside the boardroom and outside the preparation for your boards is immense the second capital that you need to bring is the intellectual capital to make sure that you can criticize and challenge and take a stand when it is necessary because if you don't do that then there is no point in your being an independent director and finally and perhaps most importantly you need to bring into the boardroom your moral capital because without that you are really not going to be able to function in the way that all our panelists have recommended we should let me with that give you three or four uh, ways that you can take your board service to an enhanced level and the first among that i would say is you need to be electrifyingly engaged not only with the corporation but with the executives you deal with with your colleagues with everybody in the ecosystem make sure that you can bring the ecosystem in a position that you can actually deliver your performance and let me talk about three innovations that you can bring in retain and perhaps enhance first of that is to bring in board tech now we have heard of fintech and we've heard of regtech and we've heard of every type of technology i want to propose today at this very critical inaugural uh, function of both iod and iica the emergence of what i would like to brand board tech and what is board tech the entire performance of the board has to be digitally enhanced and digitally supported in terms of agenda action points making sure that you are in a position to have the information you need when you need it where you are 
not wait for the next board meeting. So think about it in, say, a three-year future of a robo-director sitting in many boardrooms who has an embedded chip which will enable you to access information not only about the environment, about the company, but about regulation, about your liability, about how you need to perform, about what are the experiences of other boards in similar circumstances, what have been your own decisions in similar situations in the past, and bring to the table right there while you're in the boardroom and in the board meeting, give you that input in order that you can bring deep value, lasting value to a boardroom. Second, there are three types of mortems that we need to think about. We've always thought of a post-mortem. We always evaluate situations after they have happened or gone bad or gone well. That's a post-mortem. But an important new thing that I would like to bring to your tables is a pre-mortem. Can you as a board encourage the company to think in advance of taking big decisions, big capital outlay, a big acquisition, a big restructuring? What might be the scenarios that can emerge? What are the risks, plus and minus, that might emerge? It's called what is known, which is beginning to be talked about as a pre-mortem. And I think that's a new term that we need to use as board members to bring that. But most important of all is what I would like to call a re-mortem. You know, every time somebody brings in a new suggestion, somebody will say, oh, we tried that three years ago and it failed. But what about today? Today, technology has changed, leadership has changed, people have changed, the ecosystem has changed. We have a whole new set of circumstances. So can you not do a remortem of what is being proposed? And if you can do that, then what you are doing is you're delivering high quality innovation and high quality long term sustainable decision making to your boards. And finally, can we as a collective of independent directors crystallize for the boards we serve on a massive transformative purpose? Mr. Neeraj Gupta talked about purpose, but a purpose has to be massive and it has to be transformative if it has to be sustained and if it has to do something of deep value to the company that you are serving. So finally, if you want to be a triple A independent director, what do you need to have? You need A for attention, deep, complete, selfless, absolutely telling attention. While you're in the boardroom, you can't be fiddling with your cell phone. You can't be thinking of some other or urgent item that needs to be attended to. If you're doing that, you've lost it right there. What is required for that team spirit, that collaboration, that curiosity, all of the attributes that Mr. Bhatt pointed out, you need deep attention. And you cannot have it if you're not fully there in the boardroom. And so one of the tests that I put for making sure that the board member is really on purpose is to make sure that that attention is visible, is demonstrable, is there. It has to be patent, it has to be felt. If you're sitting in a boardroom, you need to hold it. You need to make sure that that attention doesn't waver. So that's the first A of your AAA. The second A is action-oriented. Now, if you make a whole lot of suggestions and rec recommendations and it's all put away, and if you're not monitoring and measuring for actions taken, and what are the outcomes of those actions? What's the purpose? Your purpose is lost. So your second day has to be that you will not permit a single action from remaining untaken or delayed. 
Indeed, I insist in every meeting that the minute should show who is to do what in how much time. And that becomes trackable. And that has to be made sure that it's down to zero if you actually want to make the difference. So that's your second A, action orientedness. And the third is what a lot of the panelists said. It's appraisal, both of the ecosystem of the board that you are. So you need to give feedback. If somebody is slackening on the kind of data, the quality of data, you just need to make sure that that changes. Equally, you need to be able to give feedback to slack performance of any executive. But importantly, you also have to put yourself in the path of accountability. So ask at the end of every meeting that you sit in as to whether we can do a better meeting the next time. And if we can, then how should we do it? What are the two or three actions we need to take? So I urge you to innovate and become a AAA independent director in every board that you sit on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hari Bhakti, for uh, your points. And I'm sure all of us really value it. It was great hearing you. Um, would you like to take over the Q&A session from now on? Yes. No know, questions pending to be taken. Uh, how much time do we have, Ritika? Maybe five, 10 minutes? Or yes, we could take up to 10 minutes. OK, great. I've been monitoring every question that has come up. and. You know, it's amazing how every panelist has uh, woven the answers to a lot of the questions that have been posed into what they have said. And many of us have tried to do that. But I'll take a few uh, very interesting questions. One is on remuneration. And there, I think, there is a, a set of questions which is about liability, about compensation to directors, particularly share-based compensation, which has been eliminated in India, and therefore the commitment. So may I go to Mr. Sinapa, perhaps, if he, is, uh, if he is wanting to take this up, and then Mr. Bhatt and Mr. Gujral to take on these three connected issues, the liability, the compensation, and the commitment. The whole set of questions are there. Mr. Senna, would you like to go first? Is he there? Or has he left? OK, so Mr. Bhatt, would you please take it? OK, hello. Uh, yeah. Ji, ji, am I audible? Yes, yes. OK. So, uh... I have a view on liabilities, which is completely different from what most people have. You know, technically, we have a lot of liabilities. And I think it is right that it is so. As Punita said, maybe it is a little harsh and a little excessive, but it is so. But if you look at it statistically, how many directors you know who have been in trouble because of these liabilities, number one? The number <laughs> is very small, less than 1%, maybe 0.01 or something like that. Number two. Out of those who are in trouble, how many do you really think deserve to be in that trouble? Right? Because either they were irresponsible or they did not do something right, they did not know, they did not apply themselves, did not care, etc. etc. So that is my view on liabilities, uh, you know, I, I, because I think this is over discussed. Absolutely. And right. people have a you know, lot of fear around it. But I also believe in you know, karma. If it happens, it happens. If it happens, it You do the right thing. That's right. So I want to, you know, so that is one. About compensation, you know, I saw a few questions which are strolling across the screen, you know, that compensation is very varied in India. In fact, it varies from zero to a few crores, right? So that is the variety that is there in compensation. And here, the only thing that I would like to say is that this is something, you know, before you join the company. So if compensation is important for you, for some people, it may be important, you know, which company it is, who chairs it or what domain it is in, or what service it is providing to society, or maybe it jails in with your, you know, uh, 
uh, specialized knowledge you know your your expertise your professionalism etc so there are variety of reasons if compensation is one of the reasons which which you use to decide which company you will join or if it is an important reason then how much compensation you get you know before you join the company correct so after you join the company compensation should not be an issue for you are not performing well i think then you are being disloyal perfect you are not the right person at all so perfect. liability is not an issue i think compensation is also not an issue <clears throat> and commitment is definitely not an issue if you don't have commitment why the hell do you want to become an independent director you are responsible for minority shareholders you are responsible for all the stakeholders including consumers including employees including society including economy and in many cases the country itself so if you don't want to bring commitment to a role which has got such a huge ramification why are you in that role at all absolutely you correct. have to give 100% plus commitment to this role Absolutely, absolutely. That's what I said. Wonderful, Gujral sir. Would you like to add a uh, couple of points on liability? Yes, I would advise that uh, in the company you ensure uh, you should ask and ensure that there is a director's insurance policy which is taken. Particularly now that even class action suits can be filed, that uh, would be there. And normally. at the time when you are given your appointment letter that itself specifies that there is a director's insurance policy if not you can easily ask the company and get that i don't think any company would object to that absolutely uh, on liability i would also add that uh, yes liability related to independent directors is now legally on the knowledge test uh, what mr bhat mentioned that uh, the number of instances are minuscule that is correct but back of the mind if a person has uh, a doubt the basic element you have to keep in mind is that you are committed which is the third point of commitment in which case you read everything you understand the business and you pose relevant questions once you've done that due diligence then the element of liability really does not come in yeah because yeah. you need to do your due diligence if you have shown that you have done due diligence you have posed the appropriate questions then if management gives you a false answer then you are not liable it's the management who is liable absolutely Thank you, Gujral sir. Very On insightful. On the commitment, I would only reinforce what Mr. Bhat said. If you don't have commitment, don't join. Absolutely. That is the simple, straightforward. <laughs> All of us can agree to that. Yes. Punita, to you, there is a very pointed question about the international best practices on things like compensation, on things like engagement, on things like the time that you need to spend. Uh, how do you see that uh, and i'm i'm really sorry we couldn't have the fireside chat because we've run out of time so i'll just use this time to give you uh, this question because on that you can uh, sort of elaborate and share your global experience okay so um i think on compensation um Uh, definitely i think india there is a lot uh, more uh, range as you heard it could be from zero to a few crores and uh, there is no share compensation and therefore i in my view um, compared to what you see in um, in other countries particularly i i focus on north america because that's where i have the most experience is that in in north america the uh, very um, small startups and in fact um startups can get sometimes the best independent directors because they can get shares and they see um some you know the time commitment as um for not zero whereas in india you would you if you're getting paid um zero or just like 20000 rupees for a sitting fee in a startup how many good independent directors would go and join that board when there is another alternative so i think uh, it does uh, it does hurt the smaller and mid cap companies and i think 
those companies in fact require the most um, uh, in terms of uh, governance improvement. So we need to find a way to um, improve governance of the smaller companies compared to global standards. Because globally, as I said, um, compensation and time commitment are actually well um, you know, balanced. Whereas in India, whether uh, you work for a small company as an independent director or you work for a large company as an independent director, the time commitment is roughly the same because you have the same number of committees, you have the same number of meetings, you still get need to get to know the business and all the things that Mr. Opie Bhatt said that you really need to, and as you've said, you need to be engaged and alert. So you, you have to do all the same work. So why should there be a difference? That's uh, something I think that globally people seem to have figured out. Um, so, uh, and then I find that um, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, independent thinking, there is a risk of groupthink everywhere in the world. Even in uh, other countries, <laughs> very true. there is a groupthink approach. And very uh, seldom have I seen an independent director stand up and vote against the group. So, yeah. um, I don't see in India people actually voting on proposals, but in um, in, uh, in some of my other global boards, you actually have to record your vote on every proposal uh, in in front of everybody else, and uh, and very few people have the courage to say I vote against or I abstain. And once four people have so, voted how would for, you react, Anita, to a video recording of a full board meeting, time spliced, to what so? You know, it can have an input into the year end appraisal. It could have an input into what Mr. Gujral said about liability. It could have an independent uh, contribution uh, tracking mechanism. What do you feel about video taping and time splicing board meetings? Um, so I don't have a problem with video recording. Is that your question? That the way yeah. India yeah. and then time splicing and seeing who who said what. I think look at people and um, I'm not sure I fully understand what you're saying, but let me try to answer. Um, so I think um, a lot of um, boards are uncomfortable with video recordings because they like they just don't feel comfortable having an open discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with it, but I find that a number of companies do encourage even though video recording is allowed, they don't like you to join on video. They want you to be there in person, especially to discuss sensitive matters. And they often um, uh, say that. So I think this um, COVID world is actually, I find that has made it possible that everybody joins on video and we are still able to have honest discussions. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, but I doubt right. very much to your point. I don't think anybody is actually re going back and listening to recordings other than maybe a regulator in, in area uh, whenever there's a scam, that's perhaps the video recordings I use. Otherwise, I don't think anyone really listens to them and says, how can I improve the meeting Yeah, that we okay. just had? Okay. So can we get Dr. Sharma into the discussion? Dr. Sharma, what did you feel about the uh, environment that is being kind of uh, articulated around private sector boards versus public sector boards, a point that Mr. Sinha made initially, and also speaking to the point that Dr. Uh, Neeraj Gupta made on, uh, you know, training and experience sharing and all of that. Dr. Sharma? Yeah. We can't hear you. Uh, would you put on your video and yeah? Neeraji, would you like to take it? Take up. The, ah, okay. Are you there, Dr. Sharma? Okay. There's, we are having some difficulty in in the connection. Yeah. Need it? Ah. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. We we just not able to capture your image and voice. Could uh, we request uh, the tech to help us? Is Mr. Uh, is Dr. Dalit Sharma there with us? Uh, 
If you can just quickly tell Mr. Hari Bhakti, or otherwise he'll move on to the next speaker. We'll, we'll move on to one last yeah. question, which I think is critically important. And that has to do with the age and experience of independent directors. Uh, some of the questions that came through were about having a upper limit uh, to the age of independent directors and also in terms of refreshment of the whole cohort of independent directors. So, uh, I mean, anybody who has a viewpoint on that can give us their view. Vijral uh, Saab, maybe you can go first and then we could request Mr. Bhatt to chime in and Punita to also chime in on. So it depends upon the uh, complexity of the company and the business. If it is a very simple business, then age or experience requirement becomes much less. But if it is a very complex business with international ramification, then obviously the requirement of a much broader experience and vision is definitely required. So while selecting independent directors, I would say it depends upon the specific expertise which the company is seeking from that independent director. If they are seeking expertise in terms of technological uh, uh, innovation in a particular area, then whether the individual is 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 doesn't make any difference. Very true. But if Very true. They are seeking in terms of international uh, negotiations where uh, uh, the knowledge of that particular area is also required. Then obviously the independent director at a young age may not have that sort of experience. Right. So that is an element. Right. Uh, let me also add here where the promoters are there and it is a small promoter held company, then they may really only want rubber stamps. So then age does not matter whether the individual is 70 or 75 or he's 20, 25 or what are his qualifications, it doesn't matter. So really for a company, what is it that they are looking forward in that independent director? That would Absolutely. determine. And I don't think age per se is really relevant. Agreed, sir. But, sir? <clears throat> Hello. Yeah. yeah. So I completely agree with what uh, Mr. Gujral has said. I mean, I don't think anybody can put it better than what he has said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, really, it's, it's very excellently said. So, yeah. for example, these days I got a lot of WhatsApp messages, you know, that age is only a number, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and to give you just uh, another, you know, just an example which will sort of uh, frame this. How many of our companies would not like to have persons of the eminence of, say, Warren Buffet on their board or Bill Gates? Will you sure, say that Warren sure. is 90 and therefore you will not keep him? Yeah. yeah. So, so the point Good is, question. you know, what, what is it that they are bringing to the table? Yeah. Yeah. If a person, even if he's 40 years old, but he's got cerebral palsy, you know, he cannot sit straight. <laughs> if there's a health issue, then that could be a no-no. Okay. But if a person is healthy, both in body and mind, and has a wealth of experience which is relevant to the functioning of this company's board, will you disqualify him merely because of age? Absolutely. I don't think not. that makes sense because you need wisdom and knowledge from wherever it comes. You know, in our ancient literature, it is said, you know, let good things come to us from all sides. Right. <laughs> well person? said. <laughs> well put, Katsa. Well put. Punita, any yeah, contrarian so, you know, view? I will, uh, this age thing is a very, uh, again, a cultural thing. See, in the U.S., uh, there is something called age discrimination. You can't discriminate anybody on age in any role, whether it is being a CEO, whether it is being on a board. So um, I think in India, we have this age limit even for CEOs and for all government jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I think it's age is not important. It's the experience that you bring. And, um, and as all the other, uh, Mr. Gujral and Mr. Pat have said, it's, um, I think it's, um, the board has to collectively decide whether the person is contributing. And if the person is contributing, then age shouldn't 
limit them. Indeed. Of course, if they're not Absolutely. contributing for whatever reasons, health and energy and inability to travel, etc., then that can be looked at. Yeah, thank you. So let's end our session with a. Now we've got Dr. Sharma back with us. So Dr. Sharma, if you can, you hear us. So if you yeah, can give yeah. us a bit of a feedback on how you felt through the whole uh, session that we had on private versus public sector, some of the issues that Mr. Sena raised in the beginning of our deliberations, and whatever other feedback you wish to give. Shilish, you know, we have been now training independent directors for some time. We get a feedback also. See, what I thought today, whatever was said is well known. Commitment, all wisdom, all that is known. So the point which we are trying to grapple with in, how do you bite the hand which feeds you? How do you, you know, get over things where you have got previous benefits and then you take a position? Correct. You know, this is what we are grappling. No matter how much you teach them, how much you tell them they are committed, be ethical. If you think none of these guys know what is ethical? Brilliant, Dr. Brilliant. Sahib. It's all about moral capital. Is what Let me think. give you an example. Mr. T.R. Prasad was my boss for four years. Right. One of the most outstanding officers, cabinet secretary, retired, could have got any job. Mr. Vajpay offered. He said, No, I want to go to Vaisa and live on the seaside. He was unfortunately on the Shatsatian board. Oh. And you know, today, if you see him, there are tears in my eyes. You see, what I'm trying to say is how now? Now, what will I teach TR Prasad about commitment, ethics? You cannot. See, what we are trying to now do is to teach you to make the right trade offs. Brilliant. But once you make a trade off, there's a consequence. When you get that consequence, for God's sake, don't turn around and say, I should not have done that. Yeah. That's Wonderful. That's what so That's beautifully, what so beautifully summarized and said, Dr. Sharma. Thank you. So with that, maybe bring, is there a formal vote of thanks that Ritika, you are going to give? Uh, we will have someone from IOT. Uh, so we will have someone from IOT give that. Uh, but before I invite him over, thank you so much for having this interactive session so beautifully. And though there was paucity of time, you actually summarize everyone's questions and i think there's nobody whose question uh, left unanswered you just kind of uh, took on all the main points and i'm sure um, it was as enriching for them to hear you as it was for me thank you so much mr hari bhakti thank you so with this we come to the end of the very first edition of independent directors dialogue but before we let you all go let us all thank um, our uh, very very important keynote speakers for uh, uh, giving the precious time to this very first edition and we hope you'll keep joining us for the forthcoming editions as well but before we conclude may i now request lieutenant general surinder nath pvsm retired avsm vice chairman institute of directors india ex vice chief of army staff ex chairman union public service was commissioned ex independent director on board of Larson and Tubro Limited to propose a brief vote of thanks and deliver the concluding remarks. Lieutenant General Surindranath, please. Thank you very much. It's time to say good evening. I think we all had a long session. And uh, our distinguished panelists, and they have brought in a very good point throughout. We, they have really told us what exactly is expected from the independent directors in the boardrooms and uh, their contribution in improving the corporate governance standards. Well, if you give me three, four minutes, I've been waiting for quite some time. So I'd like to share a few minutes. First of all, uh, we in the IOD, for the last 10, 15 years that I've been associated with them, we have the Golden Peacock Awards for various domains, which includes corporate governance as well as sustainability. And in corporate governance over the last 15 years, we have been getting more than 100 applications from various companies. And we have seen that how gradually over a period of time, the standard of corporate governance has improved. And to that extent, 
I think the credit goes to quite a large extent to the independent directors also. Second thing I wish to mention here is the first important point, the criteria for selection of independent directors. The top line in the Companies Act says an independent director is a person of integrity with relevant experience and expertise. Now, person of integrity, integrity is in two parts. One is your personal integrity, and the other is the professional integrity. Inte personal integrity, of course, is that your own personal code of conduct, which should be always above board, as far as the independent directors are con concerned, because each one is watching your performance. And as far as the professional integrity is concerned, in the boardroom, you must, whenever you find that certain issues are not being raised or not being discussed thoroughly, you are not getting the proper information, there are some issues on ethics, then you must speak up there. You must have the moral courage. That is your professional integrity. You must have the moral courage to speak up. I feel that that is something which we need to inculcate in our independent directors. Because if you do not speak up, after all, one of your responsibilities is a watchdog. Now, who's a watchdog? A fellow, with, but even a dog, when he's watching something suspicious, he starts barking. So therefore, whenever you find that there is something wrong, some ethics issues are involved, you must raise your voice in the boardroom. And if in the boardroom it is not clearly brought out, then the Companies Act has given you an independent forum for the separate independent director meeting, where under the lead independent director, you must raise these issues, discuss them thoroughly. The lead independent director should take up the follow-up action on these ones. And one more issue is that the maximum contribution which is expected from the independent director, and that is in the strategic planning. In the strategic planning, because the executive directors are very busy in the normal day-to-day -day running of the company, it is the independent directors which can play a more predominant role in that. Things are changing very fast, as you all know. New technologies are coming every very rapidly. Now, nearly 10 new technologies are expected to come in the next couple of years. And also you would have noticed that whatever products were in the market five to 10 years ago, because of the new technologies, they've all been wiped out. And the same thing is going to happen with the current, current products which are in the market today, five to 10 years hence, probably they will also not be there. So therefore the job of independent directors is to keep on thinking ahead keep on seeing what changes are taking place within the country, outside the country, and then see that what effect these technologies will have, what impact it will have on your company's products, on your company's technology. How the, what all uh, new changes are required to be made in the workforce, upgrading of their skills of the workforce, catering for different kind of- We, we lost him. I think there's, yeah. he's, he's having I bandwidth think we lost problems. Him. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I think I think we we're already over time. So we would wrap it out now because um, yeah. nine hundred of them joined us. So we would not take longer than this. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much, Mr. Hari Bhakti. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for to everybody. Session. Thanks to all the panelists. Fabulous, fabulous panel. I think the feedback is just very visible. Thank you to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this, all 900 of you for uh, giving your precious time. And we hope to see you soon. We'll have a very important sectoral discussion, a sectoral dialogue on oil and gas sector, which is going to be happening very soon. IOD will be sending out the calendar uh, through the mail and it will be put up on the website as well. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.